Also, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, now you're good. Okay, so today I'm covering the transition states and the Arrhenius equation. Just a review of last week, um, we reviewed or we covered kinetics and that's just tells you how fast the reaction is, how fast it's happening, and it's measured by instantaneous changes in concentration over time. So what was left over from that was kinetics is a bit more complex. Um, reactions don't just occur every time a reactant collides with another one. It's often limited by the rate of collisions, the fraction of productive collisions and the energy of the collision. So the first way we account for these limitations is using something called the pre-exponential factor. Um, this is how you would calculate the pre-exponential factor, which is represented by A. It's the uh, rate of collisions times the fraction of the productive collisions. Um, the rate of collisions is 10 to the 10th uh, so this is the diffusion limit and the rate of diffusion is often what determines the rate of collisions because collisions are random and they are limited by diffusion however um, reactions don't always happen every time there is a collision you have to account for those through something called f or the fr fraction of productive collisions which differ between the reactions the fraction of collisions of the correct orientation for chemistry to happen. So um, when collisions happen, they have to be in a specific orientation or position for the reaction to actually occur. Um, like let's say you have two reactants with a, like, but only maybe 5% of that surface is conducive to reactions. Um, F productive, it, takes into account like what the orientation has to be for that reaction to occur. And just a note, enzymes can improve the fraction of productive uh, collisions. So one way you would use this, you might be asked to calculate it. You could be given A is 10 to the second. Um, then you would know that only one in 10 to the eighth collisions is productive. And why would you know that? It's because you know that K collision is always 10 to the 10th because that is the diffusion limit. So the other thing that limits reactions or yeah, limits the rate of reactions is whether or not the collision gives you enough energy to actually um, have the reaction occur. And this is, a, this is um, represented by something called the transition state. The transition state is the point in the reaction with the highest potential energy value. It's often, or it's always going to be between reactants and products. So this is a um, kind of like a simple graph of uh, just generic reaction. Um, progress of reaction, you might see this represented by reaction coordinate. And usually the y axis is going to be energy. So once you reach the transition state, the energy is, or the reaction is energetically downhill and it can either proceed toward products or back to reactants. The way I'd like to think about this is if you imagine that at both of these wells where the reactant and products are, you have like a bucket of water and you start shaking the bucket of water, um, the harder you shake it, the more water you might get up this hill and once you get water high enough um, onto this hill, it'll just flow down into products. That's just kind of a quick way to think about it. And the energy of activation is what we represent, or the transition state is represented by the energy of activation, which is the energy difference between reactants and the transition state. And just another note about enzymes, they will often stabilize the transition state and lower the energy of activation. That's why they can speed up the rate of reactions. 
So just to go a bit more in depth into activation energy, um, the activation energy is the minimal or the minimum energy required to convert reactants into products and collisions have to provide this energy. So in order, or we usually represent this in a calculation through its relation to the Boltzmann distribution. Um, and that just tells us what fraction of the molecules that we're trying to react actually will have the energy available to um, undergo the reaction. And you've seen this equation before. Um, I think when you did entropy or something like that, um, EA was re replaced by um, delta U. This is the same general concept of the Boltzmann distribution. You're just now applying it to kinetics. And the way you would relate um, both this activation energy idea and the pre-exponential factor idea that we discussed earlier is through the Arrhenius equation, which it just tells you that the rate of the reaction is the product of both the pre-exponential factor and the um, amount or the fraction of your molecules that have enough energy to undergo the reaction. Um, this will address all of the limitations that we have for reaction rates. Um, and when you take the natural log of both sides, you get another form of the Arrhenius equation. This will give you uh, just a straight line. This is in the same format as y equals mx plus b, where y is, the y axis would be ln k, and the x axis would be inverse um, t which is the temperature. And you might be asked to solve this equation for energy of activation or any of these other things, but you will usually be given information about the others. Um, that's all I really have is, is there anything, um, any questions? Okay, um, I'm probably gonna pass it on to the next speaker. Okay, so I think you need to disable screen sharing. Okay, can everyone see mine and hear me? Okay, should be good. So what I'm going to cover is the stochastic kinetics that you've been seeing for the past uh, two and a half lectures. And I'll kind of approach it from a different angle and try to explain it differently because you already have a recording of the actual lecture. So there's no real benefit to doing that the exact same way twice. So it's not focusing very well, but so we have DNA makes mRNA and then that can be degraded. And we won't worry too much about the protein side of things. So we'll have our copy number of DNA B and D, our mRNA copy number B and R, and then there is an associated uh, quote unquote rate constants, which I'll kind of get into what they are more conceptually with for both the production and de degradation of um, mRNA. So to kind of formally define everything, so we're looking at a particular type of mRNA, not all. So that's what NR is representing, not all the, the total mRNAs, just one for a particular gene. And ND is also similar. Uh, we're focusing on a certain gene. So what is KR? which is the part that describes this aspect. So KR is the rate of transcription, but it's perhaps not best to think about it that way. I would say you should think about it more as the probability of mRNA being produced per unit time 
um, per DNA copy, but we'll say that our DNA copy number ND is one. So as you saw in lecture, it's not, and uh, maybe in your homework, it's not evenly spaced periodic events where mRNA gets produced. It's sort of hectic and um, so that's why I don't really like to think of it as a rate constant, but rather as a probability per unit time. And we're not really in like the limit where the law of large numbers applies. So there's a, real, a lot of variation. And similarly, K minus R is quote unquote the rate of mRNA being degraded. And similarly, you should think of it more in terms of a probability per unit time. Again, it's not a periodic event. So I'll kind of go to um, the quote unquote rate law that you first saw and that to determine the steady state concentration copy number. So DNR, the change in mRNA with respect to time is a function of the amount of DNA, which we'll say is, um, more or less one later, and the rate of mRNA production per unit of DNA, and then also minus NR times the rate of degradation. So this is pretty similar to how we wrote our normal rate laws, and I'll try to draw some parallels throughout um, my segment. So for here, we just had a concentration instead, and then we looked what produces it, and it had an associated rate constant, and then minus some rate constant of uh, flowing out of it and times the concentration. So it's very similar. So now, similarly to how we did it with equilibrium, to find the equilibrium concentrations or the ratios of it rather, I'll kind of do the steady state um, process. So for that, we're saying, We'll set DNR, uh, DNR DT equal to zero. Again, similar to how we had D, like concentration of ADT equal to zero. So, but this time, kind of the notation is going to be a bit different. So instead, it'll be kind of an average amount because, again, there's a lot of variation here. So, it's not too meaningful to say like the concentration like we did with kinetics because it's not a, nearly as static as a number as when we're at equilibrium in our uh, more large scale kinetics. So just kind of doing simple algebra, we can just rearrange to find that the steady state average copy number is just by just dividing by kr, uh, k minus r, this is a minus, is just this. So that's a result, but it doesn't really give the, com the best uh, description of how things are because it only gives you the average which is good if there's not really a lot of fluctuations, but this is the type of instance where there are a lot of fluctuations. So kind of to draw an analogy for why we're not really satisfied with just knowing the average amount, think about it if you had a collection of gas molecules in a stationary box and you want to say, okay, what's the average velocity? Well, that's pretty easy. It's zero. Uh, it's zero at 100 Kelvin, it's zero at 300 Kelvin. But that's not to say that the behavior of the molecules is the exact same in those two instances, because as you've seen with like your uh, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, the kind of distribution of speeds or velocities is not the same, even though the averages are the same. So averages don't tell, ev tell you everything. So. I'll kind of go on to being more quantitative, uh, unless anyone has any questions. Okay. Um, 
I am able to see the chat. So if you don't feel like speaking, you can um, message in there and I will be able to see it. So being a little bit more quantitative, so I'll draw kind of a number line and this is, will be our NR and um, these should be evenly spaced. So we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and these will just be kind of the different possible copy numbers. So instead we'll kind of think about it in terms of probability, which I would say is a better way of thinking about it rather than kind of treating it like our previous kinetics. So instead, the change in the probability of being at a given copy number over time can be thought of as um, kind of the sum of the ways that you can get into that state minus the ways that you can get out of that state. So I'll kind of just draw it in terms of summations. So kind of flux in or rather prob, prob of going in into that state minus uh, kind of flux out or the probability of going out. So I'll kind of give a specific example just because it can get kind of confusing when you just make it very generic with N. So example, the state of our copy number being uh, NR equals three. So what are the ways we can get in? So we could have NR equal to two and then another mRNA is produced. And now we have two plus one, NR is now three. But that's also not the only way. NR original could be four and then one of those degrades. So, uh, wait, three ways in. So those are the two ways in, and then there's also ways out. So it could be NR has to equal three, of course, originally, and then either mRNA produced, in which case now we'd be at four and not at, in the NR equals three state, or NR equals three and mRNA is degraded. Then we would be at two. So kind of to rewrite this um, more explicitly, I will write it out as dp n equals three, dt equals kr p of two. I'll just kind of drop the n equals um, plus four because that's uh, the n plus one times k um, minus r p of four. And I'll kind of re-explain this, so don't worry. Uh, that says p3. So here, kr, and so this is kind of using towards the beginning of Professor Groves' section. He taught you about the and and or rules. And during lecture, you um, mentioned this, but I'll go back to it. So what is the probability of you being in the P equal, of there being, um, of your flux into it by mRNA being produced? Well, it's the probability of you being in the P2 state, there being two cop mRNAs times and there being times the probability of one being produced. So you're using the and rule here. But since that's not the only way, you have these pluses and minuses, which are the or rule, basically. So what is the probability of you entering the N NR equals three state by being by having an mRNA degraded? Well, so it would be the probability, first you have to have multiple conditions. One, you have to be in the P equals four state and times the probability of an, a given mRNA degrading. And then the reason why we have a four here is because in the P four state, we have four different possible mRNAs. 
molecules that could degrade. So similarly, uh, you have these ways to flux out and like what is the chance of you getting out of the state because mRNA is being produced and you go from three to four, well, it's the probability you're in three times the probability that an mRNA is produced. And then similarly uh, for this last term, are there any questions? Okay, uh, you can always ask on Piazza if you look back and are wondering about anything or if you're unable to see because a webcam doesn't like to focus. So I won't really uh, solve it and get the analytically because that's not that useful, but what you should kind of take away from it is that you, when you try to solve for it, you end up getting probabilities in terms of other probabilities and you get kind of use kind of this recursion to get the Poisson distribution which is kind of, my notation isn't the same as Professor Groves, but I will um, detail everything. So where mu is the mean and nu is your observed count. So kind of the notation I'm using is P sub mu of nu is the probability of get it, of observing nu as your count given that the average is mu because if your average is different your poisson distribution will look different so you have to specify the average and then this is just to actually calculate it so you can just plug the numbers in and it's fairly straightforward. So what are the attributes of a Poisson distribution? So I kind of compare and contrast this to Gaussian. So for Poisson, one parameter that you need to define it, and that is uh, your average. Because unlike the Gaussian, which has the average, the mean, and the variance being, uh, you can vary one without varying the other, that's not how it is with the Poisson distribution. For the Poisson distribution, your variance is equal to the mean. Or another way to say it is your standard deviation is equal to the square root of the mean. Oh, uh, I wrote that backwards. Okay, so what else? So, the Poisson distribution is not symmetric, especially when your mu is low, but as your mu becomes larger and larger, it begins to kind of approach a Gaussian distribution. And when do you really see Poisson distributions? It's usually for kind of more discrete measurements. And I'll give kind of um, a sample problem. So let's say that you have a store and the average number of shoppers at a given time is three. So mu equals three. And then what is the probability of you seeing observing five shoppers at a given time? Um, of course, this is a very simplified model, but this is just to kind of show you how you plug in the math. So you'd say P sub, what is the probability of observing five given that the average is three? And you would just say E to the minus Three, uh, three to the fifth divided by five factorial. And that would be the math, assuming it follows a Poisson distribution. And kind of where else is this uh, seen? So in terms of like experimentation, it's used for when you have current flowing because electrons are discrete objects and the current follows a Poisson distribution. And there won't always be the exact same number of electrons flowing through a given spot per unit time. So you actually get some variation. And similar to how I said that the Poisson distribution um, isn't, um, well, I guess that doesn't matter, but 
you do get some variance and that does cause noise and it's more pronounced at uh, lower currents because your signal to noise ratio, which is basically your standard deviation over your mean would be, you end up being um, the square root of mu over mu. So it would scale inversely with the square root of your average number of electrons flowing through a given point at a per unit time or one over the square root of your current. So that's just kind of one application. So are there any questions about that? Okay, so I will move on to kind of making the model more complicated by adding protein and looking at the protein copy number. So you saw uh, both today and in the simulation and in some of the previous lectures that when you have the protein copy number, it looks kind of something like this, a sharp peak and then a decay, another peak, sharp peak, and then it will look something kind of like that. Uh, what does SNR stand for? It stands for signal to noise ratio. Um, so yeah, for, that, uh, for that, I guess it should be the, the reciprocal of that because I did kind of a noise to signal ratio for relative error. But your signal to noise gets better uh, with higher current. So why does our protein copy number look like this? So since one mRNA can make multiple copies of a protein and the amount that it produces has some variance, uh, there's a lot of variance as well. And in the example that you saw, the average mRNA is less than one. So what that means is the majority of the time, you're not actually producing mRNA. And that's why for kind of, if you divide things up into different segments and you say, this is like a segment where there's a rise um, versus this segment where it's just decay and no increase, th these decay regions occupy a longer block of time overall. So, what else is there to this kind of graph? So the protein copy number isn't Poissonian, only the mRNA. And he talked about a little bit about that today, I believe. And you don't really need to solve any like stochastic differential equations or anything to get information. You can kind of uh, intuit several properties by just looking at the graph. So since K, the rate of production of protein is much higher than KR. During these short periods um, where there's protein actually being made, you can more or less think of this as linear and ignore the decay. And then the slope would be your KP. Because for the brief moment where you have this burst, not enough time, uh, the average lifetime of the protein is much longer. So you can kind of ignore it uh, relative to the lifetime of an mRNA. So what else can you kind of look at? Well, when there's no protein being made, it looks like kind of an exponential. And why is that? So we said that DNP or I didn't, but in your lecture, you saw it is equal to kind of similar to how we did it with the mRNA. It's dependent on the amount of mRNA and the rate. And then you also have a decay, which depends on the amount of protein and this degradation rate. So what, so keep in mind that the average amount of mRNA for a given gene is less than one at a given time. So if this is equal to zero, then what you get is, uh, well, you probably might not have taken math 54, but what you get is that you have kind of a first order decay, which if you solve the differential equation is a decaying exponential. 
So, and then you can also see by kind of, like I said, by looking at the ratios of how long these spaces are, you can get a relative amount of K minus R and K minus P because you see that K minus R is very quick because these bursts are very fast as well. And kind of similar to how you can get KP from looking at the slope, you can also see how much protein was being made because since this is such a short duration and not much protein will degrade during that, then this increase is essentially only a change due to production of protein. So you can say that the height is basically just all the, um, just solely due to amount and you don't have any minus factor that causes you to net a lower number. And yeah, so that's mainly what I had to say. Um, I had some stuff about kind of why the variance is uh, larger than it is for the mRNA, but I think that isn't too relevant and I want to be able to cover Michaelis Menton, so I will turn things over to Amy. Okay, um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, just give me one moment. Let me try to share my screen. Okay, can you guys see my screen on the other part? Yes. Okay, cool. So today I'm going to briefly cover the McKellen's mentioned um, catalysis model. This was showing up in the last part of the lecture. Um, and I'm now going to go into two detail of this part. I'm going to just introduce the um, equations that you really need to know and couple graphs that are really important. So what about this michaelis mental model really is we could uh, separate that into two parts. The first one is binding, which I wrote in blue. And, and the second part is catalysis, which I read in purple. So as we can see here is the enzyme binds on the substrate. And then it will give this um, complex EX. You could consider this as the transition state as like Kevin mentioned. And then after this complex, the reaction, the catalysis reaction would happen, which gives the product and the enzyme remain unchanged. So if we put this whole uh, relationship into a graph and a mathematics equation, then we could put the y-axis as the initial velocity, v, v naught or v zero, and the x-axis as the concentration of the substrate. And what this graph looks like is a curve like this, where the top part is the maximum speed or the maximum rate of this enzyme could get to function um, to catalysis this reaction. And we call this reaction, we call this speed as V max. And there's also another really important uh, point here is where the we call it KM. So KM is the substrate concentration where the reaction at the half 
maximum speed. So there are, so the two important points or the factors V max and the KM. Is there any questions about these two factors or question about the graph? Okay. If not, then I will just continue. So if we read the relationship or the whole process in a mathematic equation way, we call this MM equation or Michaelis Menten equation which I highlight in the yellow highlighter is the initial velocity is equal to V max over one plus KM over the concentration of the substrate. Now we also know a relationship that V max is equal to K2 multiply the initial enzyme uh, concentration. Since this whole process divided into two states, we also could divide or talk about this equation into two different situations. The first one is when the concentration of substrate is low. The second one is when the concentration of the, oops, sorry, when the concentration of the substrate is higher. So let's talk about the first situation. So when the concentration of the substrate is low, and if we focus on the bottom term here, we can see it, the Km over S is much greater than one because S is low. We could consider that as a really low number. Therefore, the bottom term would eventually turn to a bot to be the same as Km over S because one is to one is much smaller than the uh, second term, right? So if we plug this term back into the original equation, what we got is here the initial velocity is equal to V max over Km over substrate concentration. And if, we, if we're ready into a more simplified version, then it will be K2, sorry, K2 over Km multiplied by Es and substrate concentration. Because we also know the relationship that Vmax is equal to K2 uh, times uh, K2 multiplied by the concentration of enzyme. So the factor that we need to know here is this term K2 over the Km. So we give a new name for this equation, which is called catalytic, catalytic efficiency. So catalytic efficiency. Is there any questions about this first? part when the substrate um, concentration is low. Okay, if there's no question, I will move to the second situation where it's the later stage of the reaction when the substrate is um, at a higher level. So similar, we're still gonna focus on the bottom term of the original equation. when. So when the concentration of substrate is high, the Km over S will be smaller than one. So the equation then will simply turn to be V naught is equal to V max, which is makes sense because when the substrate level is high, it means we're in the second stage here and this part we could approximately see is nearly the same as the uh, VMAX, right? So as mentioned before, we know that VMAX also equal to K2 times 
concentration of the enzyme. So at this moment, we were no longer calling K2 as the second uh, reaction constant. Second reaction constant. We gave the K2 a new name, and we call it the catalytic rate constant. So you need to know the different names of the different reaction constant at different situations. This is likely to show up in the exam and ask you to look for a particular uh, coefficient or constant, and you need to know what you are looking at. Is there any questions about these two situations? If not, I will move into um, other part as the graph. I will wait for like 10 seconds. Wait, actually, I have a question. Um, yeah. Why, why, so, uh, for this, for when substrate level is high, why is a V zero equal to V max? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so similar. So, do you understand the first part, like the derivation part of when we talking about when the substrate level is low, like how, like the general process, how we approach it? Yes. Yeah, so similarly for the second one, um, if I rewrite it again, so when the substrate level is high, we know Km over S will be smaller than one, right? right? Because for example, like, I don't know the specific number, but for example, we're saying the concentration of S is 10 or 100. So if this one is much, not much, or like smaller than one, when we look at the bottom term, one plus Km over S, then we're gonna only focus on this term, one, because this one is really, really small. Oh, okay, I just got it, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, is there any other questions? Yeah, there's one in the chat. How low oh. should the concentration of substrate be? Is it a common situation in biology? Um, so to be honest, I'm not quite sure about how low we could call it low. So how low should S be? So are you asking like, is there a um, the basic line, like cutoff line where you say low and high? And if that's your question, um, I don't really have a good answer saying where is the threshold. So in those two situations, we're just generally seeing when the substrate level is low and when the substrate level is high. I'm not sure if that could answer your question, but this is what I could get the best out of. <laughs> The level of substrate is determined uh, by the value of the Michaelis constant Km. So when the substrate concentration is low compared to Km, that's called a low substrate con concentration. So it depends on the enzyme. Okay, thank you, Professor. Did you hear the, uh, okay, good. Um, is there any other questions? Okay, if no, then I'm gonna, we have uh, five minutes left. Um, I'm gonna go into this graph. So as you guys see here, this graph, the Michaelis mentin graph here is in a curve. And most of the case, if we wanna analyze the data, for example, we would like to know the Km or the Vmax, um, it's not really easy to do so. So in order to analyze the data easier and more visualize what do we have here, uh, the curve could be linearized. And this is a common way that people use to simplify the curved data. 
so there are two uh, there are two graphs that are important uh, when this is linearized. So the first one is called um, lean beaver birth plot. And so I guess it's a scientist calling Viver and a, another one called Burke on this one. And how they do it is they take over, take one over the entire uh, equation. So I'll just put V now. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of the derivation, how you got this um, final result. But if you take the one over the entire equation, the equation I'm talking about is this one here. So if you take one over of this entire equation, what do you will got? The final result is one over V naught is equal to one over V max plus Km over V max times one over substrate. Now we'll highlight this one in the highlighter. Okay, so what does it look like in a graph? Because this is what we care about the most. So similar, the y-axis is the one over v now, as we just mentioned, and x-axis will be one over substrate. So um, make this one. Because one over something cannot be zero, so the zero point is here. And the linear rise the graph would look like something like this, where the x intercept is the one over negative Km, and the y intercept is one over V max. And we also, another information we could know is that the slope of this graph M is equal to Km over V max, which is the one here. Okay, is there any other questions? Is there any questions about this plot? So everything only for this plot, you need to know the equation first. Second, you need to know this graph and the intercept, like what they're stands for. And you're able to identify the name of this graph, which is important. Uh, you don't need to really know like how did you get this uh, graph, like take one over the whole equation. But it's just for more information. Okay, if there's no more question, I will just go to the last part of the second graph, which we call it Edi Hafti. If I'm not sure if I pronounce it right. Um, this is the second way of how we linearized this um, Michaelis Menten curve the graph. So the way they did it is they multiply the bottom term, which is one plus Km over the substrate on the both uh, side of the equation. So in doing so, the final result will be turned as V now is equal to negative Km multiplied we know over substrate and plus V max. So immediately you can see this graph should be something uh, have a negative slope. So we have V now as the Y axis, V now over S as our X axis. And the graph is with is a linear graph with a negative slope. And the slope M is equal to negative Km, the x-intercept 
uh, sorry, the y, uh, y axis intercept is v max. So this is all what I have today as about, it's just about the um, graph and some equation. Um, if you have any questions, you could put in the chat and otherwise, I think it's the time, um, the problems that tutors could take over. Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, we can go ahead and get started with the uh, problem set uh, 12 review. So um, I think we'll go in the order, uh, we'll start with question one and then we'll do four and then two and then three. So please feel free to unmute yourself at any point to ask questions. Um, and you can also put them in the chat and we'll try to look there too. Uh, so with that, we can start with question one, which will be Janine. Okay, yeah, just give me a sec to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen and hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Um, so for question one, there are two reactions. Reaction A and B and part A ask you to determine the order of reaction for both A and B. And let's do some reviews um, on order of reaction first. So if a reaction is zero order and as you may recall from the lecture it means the rate of the reaction is independent of the concentration of reactant and if you integrate of the rate equation that will give us the time dependence of the concentration so which is sorry so on a graph uh, the y-axis is the concentration of reaction and x is the time. Um, the concentration of reactant A will decrease in a linear manner. So if the half-life is 20 minutes, after another 20 minutes, all of the reactants is gonna be used up because for any amount of uh, the same time period, uh, the same amount of reactant A is going to be used for the reaction. And similarly, for a first order reaction, um, the time dependence of concentration is this. And one special um, thing about first order reaction is that the half-life is always the same. Because if you, um, for, um, if you plug in like half, of the original concentration of reactant A, you will always have the same T. So on the graph, if a reaction is first order and the half-life is 20 minutes, you'll get that like um, at 40 minutes, half of the remaining reactant is gonna be used for the reaction. And for the second order reaction, it is more complicated. So if um, for a reaction, if the half, uh, a second order reaction, if the half-life is 20 minutes, you expect to see that less amount of reactant will be used compared to the first 20 minutes. So I think um, from there, it's pretty easy to determine the order of reaction for reaction A and B. And once you determine the order of reaction for reaction A and B, I think you can work out um, part B um, pretty easily. So uh, we can work in, uh, in ab arbitrary units. So let's assume the total um, concentration of reactant A to begin with is one unit. 
And we know that um, they all have the half-life of 20 minutes. So uh, if you plug in this number to um, the corresponding equation for the order of reaction, you can easily work out the rate constant K. And now you have K, and because it asks how long will each take to reach 90% of completion, which means 90% of the reactant A is used. So A now is equal to 0.1 unit. And if you plug in 0.1 and K into the corresponding equation, you can easily work out um, for the time. And that's um, how you solve question one. And does anyone have questions about this problem? Okay, um, so if not, um, we will go over question four and just feel free to private message me on Zoom if you have any additional questions. Hey everyone, I'll uh, I'll be going over question four today. Can everyone hear me and see my yep. screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, um, in question four, we are essentially asked how the RNA copy number um, varies under this specific condition right here, um, this scheme right here. And um, in the first question, we're asked, uh, given that given this scheme. Um, what's like the steady state condition and steady state just means that the change in or DNR over DT is equal to zero, which is the equivalent of saying that the number of mRNA molecules does not change over time or that um, the concentration of mRNA is some constant. And then it asks, is this the same as equilibrium? Um, this is not the same as equilibrium because in equilibrium, uh, the concentrations can actually fluctuate until they reach um, their fixed point equilibrium value. Whereas in this, the concentrations do not fluctuate. They are um, that constant number. All right. So part two asks us to derive the average mRNA copy number um, as a function of uh, DNA, so N sub D, um, and then these two rate constants right here. Um, so I'll do that down here. The first thing we can use is what we discovered in part one, that DNR over DT equals zero. And then from this scheme right here, we can see that uh, the change in RNA is equal to uh, the production, which is N sub D times K sub R, um, minus the degradation, which is that thing right here. And then if we combine the two, and do a little bit of algebra, we'll end up with um, N sub R is equal to the DNA times the ratio of the rate constants. So this gives us the per cell case. And now we wanna generalize this to the um, per system case. So the way we can do that is by summing out across um, all the cells in the system. So um, that's the per system case. Um, and then we can use uh, the identity that the sum is equal to the average times the number of, of um, cells in the system to simplify this to n times the average under steady state is equal to the same thing here times the ratio. And we can see that these n's cancel out. So we're left with a concise equation, which is that the average number of RNA molecules in steady state is equal to uh, steady state DNA times the ratio of the um, 
rates. Right. So that's, oops, that's part two. Um, part three asks us about uh, the, uh, it says, um, assuming that the RNA uh, production is 100 and, or set per second, and then the uh, degradation is 10 molecules per second, um, what is the expected mean value of RNA per cell? So uh, for this question, we just have to plug in these numbers into our equation from part two. Um, so that's equal to, uh, we can assume that there's one DNA molecule per RNA uh, produced. So that's one here times 100 over 10, which is equal to 10 molecules of RNA. All right, so that's part uh, one. I'll quickly stop. Does anyone have any questions about this? No? All right. Um, so for part B, we're looking at the Poisson distribution, uh, which is characterized by a single parameter, uh, which is usually called lambda. And uh, lambda is equal to the, it, is, it describes both the expected value, which is the mean, and the variance of the Poisson distribution. Um, so that's what makes this distribution unique. And typically, we use the Poisson distribution for systems with a uh, lot of possible events that are each individually very rare. Um, I think it was created when someone was calculating the average number of soldiers killed by accidental horse kicks in, in their army. So that's obviously a really rare event, um, which is what the Poisson distribu distribution describes. The general form is the probability that x equals some value, I'll just call it little x here, um, is given by e to the negative lambda times, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the formula, times, I think lambda to the x all over x factorial. I think that's the correct form. Um, all right, with that, we can get started with part one, which asks us, asks us uh, to use our rate constants from part A to show more that more than 80% of the cells in the population will have a different number of RNA molecules than the mean value. So we know from this from part C that the mean is uh, 10. And basically what this question is asking, write it down here, is that um, we wanna show that the probability that X equals 10, which is the same thing as lambda, is, equal, is, is less than uh, 20%. So we can just plug that into our Poisson distribution um, P of x equals 10 is e to the negative 10 times 10 to the power of 10 all over 10 factorial, a lot of 10s. Um, and then if you calculate this out, uh, there's a lot of tricks you can use like um, taking the log to, to make the numbers easier to deal with. But this, this ends up being less than 0.2%, um, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Or sorry, not 0.2%, 20%. Um, now we can move on to part two, which is a lot more involved. Um, and it asks us to calculate the number of cells that will survive some antibiotic condition, um, given that the initial cell population is 10,000 and any cell with more than 20 mRNA molecules uh, is, is going to survive. Um, so essentially this question in probability terms is asking us to calculate the probability that X is greater than or equal to 20 times the initial number of cells, I'll call C sub i. Uh, um, and the question tells us, and we can look from this graph, that the probability that x is greater than 20 is actually negligibly small. That's what it says in this note right here. Um, so this, is, this probability is equivalent to the probability that x equals 20 plus the probability that x is greater than 20. Um, and then, like I just said, this is negligibly, negligibly small, so we can just call it zero. And now we're just, uh, right now we just have to plug in numbers to calculate the probability that x is equal to 20. So we can use our Poisson distribution again, and we can write that as probability of x equals 20 is given by e to the negative 10 times 10 to the 20 over 20 factorial. Um, and then we'll get some number for this. Um, I'll call it 
k, I guess. Um, and then we can multiply by 10,000, which is our initial um, concentration or initial number of cells to get the final answer. Yeah. Uh, I think that's all of question four. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions before I stop sharing my screen? All right. Um, I'll stick around in the chat if you do have any questions. All right, um, I think I'll go ahead with question two. Um, share my screen first. Um, okay. Okay. Can everyone see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so question two, um, you are studying the reversible binding of a drug to its target protein using an equilibrium assay similar to an assay that was discussed in the textbook. Um, in the experiment, an observed rate constant, uh, K observed, for the drug binding to the protein is inferred from this uh, time-dependent change in fluorescence as the protein binds to the drug, as shown here. Um, and they say, suppose these data are acquired at a drug concentration of 3,000 micromolar, and um, they also tell you the value of K off. And they ask you to calculate the dissociation constant. Um, so to remind you what we're looking at here, um, we have a drug binding to a protein, and the rate constant for the binding is given by K on, and the rate constant for uh, kind of unbinding is given by K off. Uh, what we're looking at is basically that when the drug binds to the protein, um, there's a loss in fluorescence. So it's fluorescent here, but not when it's bound. So that's why we're seeing this dip, uh, this decrease in fluorescence over time. Um, and the important thing to know for this question is um, that the speed of ligand binding shown here uh, can be what's called pseudo first order um, if the concentration of ligand is much greater than protein and doesn't change much during the reaction. So what we're saying is that uh, K-on is normally uh, second order bimolecular rate constant because we have protein and ligand coming together as reactants. But if we make the kind of assumption and say that the concentration of ligand is so much more that it doesn't really need to be considered. We can say this is like pseudo first order. Um, so that comes in to the question um, a little later. Um, so knowing that it's pseudo first order, I think Janine brought up that for first order reactions, the rate constant uh, or the half-life is constant and it's given by this equation. So um, really the first thing we wanna do in this question is uh, figure out what um, the half-life is so that we can solve for uh, K observed. And actually you can get the half-life here from the graph, right? So the half-life is the time it takes for uh, half of this fluorescence to go down. So if you just sort of look, it started at one and go down to 0.5 and kind of come across here and it looks like it's around two seconds. So you can get half-life from the graph, plug it into this equation, and you'll want to solve for K observed. Once you do that, um, there's kind of a series of equations that will get you to the what you need to get to, which is the dissociation constant. And the first one is this uh, K observed uh, is equal to um, adding K prime on, and this is the pseudo first order rate constant, um, which is equal to uh, just the uh, kind of normal rate constant for uh, the on reaction times the ligand concentration. And you have the ligand concentration from the question, you have K off from the question, and you would have just solved for uh, K observed. So you'll be able to calculate um, the K on. Once you have that, the next kind of step you'll want to take in the question is to um, use this equation to get to the dissociation constant. 
So remember that you can get KD from uh, calculating K off divided by K on. Um, so those are the steps to take to solve question two. Um, if you were confused by any part of this, uh, the textbook section uh, 15.12 explains this uh, pseudo first order really well. Does anyone have any questions about question two? Okay, um, please feel free to message in the chat if you wanna ask something. Um, I think we can move on to question three. Uh, hi everyone, can you hear my voice properly? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go over question number three. In question number three, you're given information about a, oh my God, again. About a first order decay. As my friend mentioned, for, in, for the first order reaction, we know that K equals to ln of two over T one half. But this is a shortcut that comes from another formula of the first order reaction that is the concentration of something equals to its primary concentration times e to the negative kt that if you put concentration of A equals to half of the concentration of A naught, you're gonna get the same reaction. In order to solve part A, I'm gonna use the mention this equation. I'm just gonna move it a little bit around to just get the K equals to ln of two over, we know that the half-life is 5,200 or 5,200 and it's year. Our ln doesn't have a unit. So your final answer for the K is gonna be a number with the unit of one over a year because my time has the year as a unit. Then, in order to get the, the time that is required to get to the four units, you're gonna use this formula that I mentioned in order to find the time. Now you have the K value here, and then you have the first concentration and the second concentration, and you can find T. In order to find the T, I'm just gonna take this equation, and I'm gonna divide both sides by a concentration of A naught, which is gonna be equal to E negative KT. And if I take ln of this, equation, I'm going to get the negative kt equals to ln of a over concentration of my a naught. And if I move the k to the other part, to the right side, I'm going to get a t that is equal to negative ln of A, concentration of A over the, first, the initial concentration of A times one over K. And then you can use the K that you found here to put it here and get a number. Just be careful to show the units for each part. In the part B, you're given a graph. 
here you're given a graph and then this graph has the ln of k as y and one over t as x. Whenever you see something like this that has the ln of k and t, the first equation that should come to your mind is the Arrhenius equation that relates our k to the activation energy. If you take the ln of this equation, you're going to get ln of k equals to ln of a minus activation energy over r times 1 over t. I just wrote it this way to just make it easier to see the y equals to b minus mx or I'm just going to put a plus here and then move the negative sign inside. So what we're asked to do actually is to find the m which is the slope and also to find the intercept to get the values that we need. In order to do that, I'm gonna write my slope as negative activation energy over R, which is gonna be negative 1.5 Um, it's going to be my y, which is this one, my delta y over delta x, or the difference in y over the difference of x. After this, I'm going to get a number, but the problem is that this number that you're going to find needs its units and to just get the unit, we need to go back to the k equals to a e to the negative e a over r t to find it. We have to Keep that in mind that A has the same units as our K and also our activation energy over RT should have no units, right? That's the reason that my A has the same unit as the K and my negative EA over R is going to have the units of Kelvin just to cancel out the unit of 1 over T. So therefore, you can write the EA over RT and then you can just put 8 point... Uh -oh. 31 joule over mole over Kelvin <coughs> equals to whatever you got in Kelvins. And you're going to see that this Kelvin is going to cancel out with the Kelvin that you have for your M. And then if you solve this part, you're going to get your activation energy that is going to be in the units of kilojoule per mole. <laughs> oh. Sorry.
Okay. Then we need to find uh, our ln of a. And in order to find the ln of a, I'm going to use this equation again. And this y equals to b plus mx. My b here is my ln of a. Therefore, if I use one of these two numbers and put it in the equation, I should get the ln of a. I'm going to use the second set of numbers and it's going to be the y is one point negative 1.3333. Sorry for my hand, bad handwriting. And uh, uh, the first part is going to be ln of a. That is missing. And plus the m times the x value that is going to be 0. Oh, I'm sorry. My pen is giving me a hard time. It's going to be 0. 0, 0, 3, 3, 3. And you can solve it for ln and get it. The only thing is that this m is a negative number. That's the reason that it may look different than what you have, but don't worry about it. If you solve it properly, you're going to get a positive number for your ln of a and then you can find the a by just rise the number to the ba by using e base in the next part we're told that an enzyme accelerates the rate constant 10 times over the uncatalyzed reaction that we just found in the previous section by perturbing the activation energy, calculate the difference in the activation energy at 300 Kelvin. In order to do this part, I'm going to write the K of catalyze or the K with the enzyme over the uncatalyzed one that is what we found in the previous part. And if I just write down the Arrhenius equation for both of them, this is the catalyzed one or with the enzyme. And in the bottom, I'm writing the one that is not catalyzed or is what you found in the previous section. If I just simplify this, I'm going to get, since the enzyme changed the activation energy, it doesn't have to do anything with the A, so I can just cross it out and then I'm going to have my E to the power of EA uncatalyzed or what I found before minus activation energy of the catalyzed one over RT. And I know that the catalyzed over uncatalyzed one is 10 times faster. So the value that I'm going to get for K catalyzed over K uncatalyzed is going to be 10. And if I take the ln of this part, I end up with something like the activation energy of the uncatalyzed 
minus the activation energy of catalyzed one equals to uh, L N of 10 over RT, I just moved the RT, times RT, I'm sorry. I just moved the RT from the denominator here to the other side. You have your T that is 300 Kelvin. You have the R that is 8.31 Joule per mole. Per Kelvin, you have the ln of 10 that is unitless, and you also have the uncatalyzed EA from the previous section that you can use to find your final EA catalyzed or EA of the enzyme that is this value. So use it and find the number for this section. Any question about this part? Then I'm gonna to move to the last part that is more conceptual. You're told that the act activation energy of the enzyme is less than the activation energy of uncatalyzed reaction. And this is usually what we expect because our enzyme lowers the activation energy by changing, by using a different path for doing the reaction usually. And because of that, we get a smaller value for the enzyme versus a bigger value for the uncatalyzed one, that is this one. And because of that, we get the change in the rate that is related to the EA over RT, or just to see it easier, I'm gonna write it A over E to the power of the activation energy times RT. So you can see here, as the EA increases, my rate decreases, and that's the reason when enzyme decreases the activation energy, of the reaction, you get a higher rate. But this has almost nothing to do with the, it has nothing to do with the spontaneity of the reaction. Spontaneity of the reaction has to do with your free energy and the change in free energy. So if you have an exergonic reaction, like the one that is showed in this graph, you're gonna get the reaction to be spontaneous. So my delta G is what determines whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. And it has nothing to do with my activation energy and increase and decrease in activation energy because the enzyme changes activation energy on both sides so that the overall reaction, change, overall change in the free energy of the reaction stays the same. And any question about this part? I think I shouldn't give away the answer, but it's okay. Is there any question? Well, I think if no one has a question, we're, or we, we can stay longer since we're done with the thing, with the tutoring and the, with the problem set, we can stay longer to answer more questions if students have specific question about a specific
part, but we are done for today and have a great end of the semester. <laughs>